Well, let's get started uh, for the sake of time. If folks join us as we go along, um, feel free to uh, join in. Landon Donovan, he may not be the greatest player of all time, but one of the greatest bald athletes of all time. So I'm always been fond of any athletes that are losing their hair, Landon Donovan, LeBron James, um, some of the great ones, Tiger Woods. So thank you all for, for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gary Kahn. I'm the Associate Director of Programs. And I know Shane Land, our Assistant Director for Intramural Sports and the Park and Heather Marshall and the whole Intramural team have organized this series um, focused on development, but also focused on officiating and focused on bringing in some folks that can speak to you and speak to what it's like officiating at all different levels. And hopefully while we're in this period of uh, remote instruction and learning online, uh, you know, this is around the time of the year we'd have our Intramural Sports Officials Banquet and we'd have different guest speakers. I, for years, wanted to get this guest today to come speak to our students, but he's always jet setting everywhere around the world. Every time I check in with him, he's in India, he's in the Dominican, he's in South America, he's in Texas, he's all over the place. So um, we are fortunate that Mark's been able to join us today and uh, it's not a coincidence we have the same last name. Uh, Mark is my brother. Uh, you could tell who's older by who has uh, more gray in their beard. Actually, he might be beating me. You could tell who's older by who has less hair on top. <laughs> um, a little bit older, but uh, excited for Mark to join us. Um, Mark I had Shane send out his bio, has been a very accomplished soccer official on the field, working in Major League Soccer, working international friendlies. I saw a lot of Leo Messi written in the chat. Uh, one of my highlights was going to a, a game back in 2012 um, down at um, Hard Rock Stadium, whatever it was called then, and seeing Mark on the field referee and Messi uh, in a game. So he might talk about that a little bit later. Um, but now he works for CONCACAF. And so I'll introduce Mark that way and maybe ask the first question. Um, and I should say this, if you have questions, uh, Nikki sent me a bunch in advance. If you have questions you want to ask, throw them in the chat and then uh, we'll either read them for you or we'll call on you if you feel comfortable asking them later on. We hope to be on with you for an hour. And so we're excited to um, hear from Mark. So Mark, if you could just start off, tell us about uh, what CONCACAF is for our students who may be unfamiliar with the world of uh, international soccer confederations and what your primary role for them is. Great. First, uh, Gary, thank you. And, and thank you to everyone for taking the time today to, to join the call. Uh, you know, these are some difficult times and we're all moving into new and innovative ways to operate on a daily basis. So uh, I hope everyone, you know, first of all, is safe, your families are safe, and uh, emotionally and physically, you're all doing well. And, and if you're not doing financially well, maybe uh, you can reach out to my brother Gary after the call. Uh, but uh, CONCACAF is the Confederation of North, Central America, and the Caribbean Associations of Football. We're one of the different, um, many different confederations that is under FIFA. So FIFA is my new mom and dad in terms of my work world. And tell us about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. You're the manager of referees. Obviously right now is a, an interesting time, but kind of take us back. Um, I mentioned sure. how you travel all over the place. What do you do to contribute and develop to the game of soccer through the officiating program? So luckily living in the United States and coming up through the officiating ranks here I've been very fortunate and we have about 150,000 referees that are registered in the United States and, and in the Confederation we have about 250,000 in total. So, you know, with 41 different countries, you can imagine, you know, where there's only 60 officials in Guyana and what type of support they, they receive. So, you know, now as the manager, um, I, I'm managing development as it relates to the different member associations, providing them with education and you know, the resources to improve their officials. And I'm also working as the project leader for the Video Assistant Referee Project. You know, you've seen VAR being implemented in Major League Soccer and in the World Cup. So I do a lot. I, I'm 
you know, we're a very small department. We have three people within the Department of Refereeing, whereas in UEFA, the, the confederation over in England, Europe, you know, they have probably about 15 or 20 people in their referee department because of the different financial resources around the world. And CONCACAF, a lot of you might know about some of the history and some of the issues, and, and we're just coming out of, uh, you know, a, a very bad financial place into a very positive financial place and, and starting to change our culture at CONCACAF. So I do a lot just around the world. I, you know, I really enjoy making an impact uh, to those smaller countries that really could use the support. So take us back, Mark, maybe to the beginning. A lot of the students here are either in their first year of officiating ever, or they've officiated for a couple years. They may do some stuff on campus. They may do some stuff in the community, uh, high school sports. Some have even progressed maybe to some college, small college uh, basketball. How, how did you get started in soccer um, officiating? And what was that beginning period like for you uh, around your development? Sure, I mean, you know, as a young kid, I never wanted to get a job, as you know, working at the pet store, cleaning up dog poop on the aisle or, you know, stocking groceries or anything like that. So, you know, being a soccer player in the recreational program, I was always at the fields. And luckily, I had my older brothers who had friends that were officiating on the recreational level. And to make 15 bucks cash to go stand there for 45 minutes and sort of get, you know, a little bit of exercise, uh, some sun, you know, and be around people. It was just, just a better, a better thing for me. And, you know, it was almost like babysitting for me. My parents could drop me off at the soccer fields and 14 years old, I could referee little eight year olds and, and make some money every night of the week and all day Saturday. So that, that was the motivation getting started. And I really, I didn't know that there was a way to upgrade and, and continue the process. I just did a lot of, um, you know, just local things just because it was about being cool with my brothers and my brother's friends. They did it. They officiated and it was part of a group and it was a friendship. It was like our, our referee gang posse. So I always, people ask me, how do I become a college basketball official? I could tell them all the steps they have to take. Uh, people ask me, because I officiated high school football and college football, here's what you have to do to, to get to that level. If someone had interest beyond officiating intramural sports of progressing, whether it be to high school level, to the international level, major league soccer, like the level you got to, what, is, what are some of the pathways and what's your advice for them to get started? That's a great question because, you know, like I said, I, I started in 94 and didn't realize until 10 years later almost that there is a pathway to, to do more games at a higher level. And so I feel like there was 10 years of experience being built, but almost wasted time in my development to get to the higher levels. And how do, how do you do that? How do you, you know, what does it take to get started? Well, my, my recommendation is, you know, the intramural sports is a great start you know, you, you get to talk with your friends, you're, you're out there making friends, you know, you're, you're having good experiences. But if you really like that intramural level and you wanna see if you like, you know, the next step, I'd say get, get involved in high school soccer. And in Orlando, you have the High School Sports Officials Association of Central Florida. And my good friend, Eddie Loyola is the president of that association. And if anybody's interested, I'm, I'm happy at, at a, you know, to provide the resources in order to get in touch. But joining high school soccer, I think was the turning point for me because then I, I found, you know, the camaraderie and the mentors and the people that have been there. You know, I'd, I was fortunate. There was a guy named Reggie Ruddy, may he rest in peace, young referee who passed away, who he was one of the first officials to work in major league soccer who was in my local member, so, uh, you know, my local high school association. And he kind of guided me and, and helped get me to where, you know, where I got to. And, you know, you basically, you know, you, you become part of this group, you, you, you make money and you, you get a taste, you, you put your foot in the pool, for example, and, you know, you get a sense of, do you really want this just from being a high school official? And if you do, then I would say join the United States Soccer Federation, become a grassroots referee, you know, take the process 
further because now you you feel like you like it. You can make a couple hundred bucks in a in a night refereeing high school soccer. Now, if you like it, you can go down the federation path and see if you want to progress to the professional level. And so for you, I think people would be interested hearing how that experience happened for you. So how did you then make the jump from high school to then either college or uh, working professionally? So one of the things that's really important is, um, you know, just overcoming adversity. I think overcoming adversity is, is so important because you're going to have a lot of people along the way that are going to tell you, you're, you know, you're too old, you're too young, you're not fit enough, you're, you're not good enough. And, you know, you have to know and in your heart what you want. And, you know, there's a lot of balancing during this, this career. You know, it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree because I devoted everything I could to wanting to be the highest level official I possibly could. And I did that at an expense. And, you know, then I, I realized that, you know, the opportunity is to really, you know, just have humility and, and to go through this process and, and be dedicated to an assigner. You know, never t say no, always take the opportunity, have your bag packed, ready to go, you know, Obviously, family first, uh, your job is important, your school is important, but it, if you really want something, you just put your mind to it, obviously, it's going to happen if you put it into the universe, right? You, you can make anything happen. What, um, I guess more specifically, when did you kind of get that call that you could work higher level games? Did you go to, I know in basketball, a lot of these students know you can go to a camp in the summertime, there's people identifying you, uh, you apply to a conference, you get the call, and you get scheduled games. How, how does it work in soccer? Um, and is it different based on region, yeah, so, location, level? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you got to start in your state level, then you go through the, the President's Cup tournament, then you, then you go through the State Cup tournament. And then if you're one of the top performing officials at State Cup, you get sent to the regional youth regional tournament, which I never was sent to. And I'm one of the guys that is, you know, a clear example of overcoming adversity, not getting the same opportunities. And it, it's about bounce back ability. How do you overcome these certain circumstances and, and roadblocks when people don't want you or say you're not good enough? If you just keep going and you commit yourself. Every year I went to this, this state cup tournament and it didn't happen. But then I just got a phone call one weekend that said, hey, we need a male referee to go to the ODP Interregional Tournament in Boca Raton, Florida. You live in Fort Lauderdale. Can you go and support this Women Referee Academy as a male official? Because the two instructors are male and they needed two male officials to participate. So obviously I put my hand up, I'm ready to go. I'm always available and I went, committed to this. And I met two guys, Paul Tamburino and Alfred Klinitis from US Soccer at the time. And we became best of friends after that, that little tournament. And they said, hey, what are you doing next week? You want to come to the Armed Forces National Championship? You know, absolutely. And, and then one thing uh, came from that. I was invited to the Nike Friendlies Tournament in Sarasota at the time, before the U.S. Soccer started the Development Academy Showcase, which is now no longer. They just recently announced. But I went to this tournament, and I was appointed to the USA-Brazil game. Um, I had a situation where the referee on the field didn't manage very well. A mass confrontation ensued and I ran out onto the field in a triangle of a triangulation to monitor the misconduct. And I performed very well. I, I did the things I needed to do. And after that event, um, a week later, I got a phone call that said, you've been invited to major league soccer preseason camp. And I was one of 86 officials that, was invited to MLS camp at the time. So, you know, it's now it's a different process. Now um, with collective bargaining agreement and uh, the major league soccer officials, you know, being the last professional sports entity in, in the United States to unionize as officials, I was part of the first ever, you know, collective bargaining agreement. Um, with that unionization, you know, it's now changed the development and the entry into officiating at the highest, highest ranks. But, 
you know, it's still a similar process. You just have to go through the, you know, the grassroots level at U.S. Soccer, and then eventually you can make it into the professional ranks just by staying committed and, you know, being uh, on top of your craft. I think you once told me one time, and I don't know if I remembered this wrong or maybe you can clear up whether it's true, but didn't you once tell me that at the time you could – you would get paid more to officiate a division one SEC soccer game than a major league soccer game? Yeah. You know, uh, I, I've officiated, I think two games at the university of central Florida as, as a collegiate official, and I'm still a college referee. I have, uh, hopefully, um, we're, we're very much hopeful that the season will, will start at some point here. Um, I have about 15 games on my schedule for, you know, the Big 12, the Big 10, uh, Pac-12, SEC, and ACC games. And I also do the uh, UCFs in the AAC conference, I believe, right? Um, so the assigner, you have a new assigner this year. So I still remain active for that. But in those games at the Division One level, you know, you can get paid $1,000. And the $1,000, you know, when I'm traveling to University of Texas or – you know, whatnot. I can use my miles and, uh, or I can buy the flight and I stay with a bunch of buddies that are on the game with me and in a hotel, we rent a car together, we split the costs. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I keep 750 bucks in my pocket and the 250 paid for my expenses. Whereas in, in some of the professional games uh, growing up, when I first was doing some of the Orlando city games, when they were in the USL and second division, I was making 125 bucks to drive up to Orlando to officiate in second division games. And, and in my first year in major league soccer, I was making, you know, before the union and this, the collective bargaining agreement, I was making only a thousand bucks for an MLS game. So college soccer officiating, you know, is something that is not difficult to get into, but it pays very nicely. What, um, What's the need out there? I know in my awareness of officiating in general, um, the average age of the high school official, particularly in Florida, is um, you know, in their 60s. And I know in soccer, um, just because of the fitness level required, it's maybe a little bit harder to officiate at that age. Although I remember growing up some, some older people officiating and you know, they did their best, but what's the need? What's the demand? I, you mentioned the grassroots level. Is there... Uh, just a huge need for young soccer officials to get into the high school game and, and above? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there, there needs to be culture change. I think there's a high need. I think what's happening is, you know, that grassroots referee, your, you know, your officials in intramural sports, you get out there and you get somebody screaming and yelling at you and you say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to deal with somebody yelling at me. I'm not their therapist. I'm not here to you know, teach them behavior modification. But at the end of the day, you know, um, you know, we really need the, the young officials to come in to support culture change. It's, it's important to have a succession plan and, and a development plan for officials to come out. Because, you know, one of the questions that I think is uh, important from, from Nikki, and I don't know if you want me to get into that now. Yeah, go ahead. There was one that, you know, really I thought was – you know, uh, attributes to what you're asking. And, you know, it's, it, it says that um, uh, what is your, what is your uh, how has, uh, has your conflict management style changed over time? And if so, how? Right. I, I think it kind of is um, it, just important to go at. And I've been thinking about this since I was running this morning. And I think that you know, one of the, sorry to go off topic here a little bit, but one of the most important things in officiating is humility and understanding that, you know, when you're out there, not taking anything personal is so important. And at a young age, I'd go out onto the field and, you know, I was a punk referee. I was one of those guys. I wanted to be a police officer in college. So I went out onto the soccer field as a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kid. And I was yelling at people, sending coaches off, telling them to take a hike and go into the parking lot. And I was really uh, not the nicest of officials. And over time, I learned that, you know, 
being humble is so important. Having humility and not taking anything personal is so important. And it really has helped with, over time, my conflict management skills. And, and I think there's a couple of things that I can, you know, resources that I can tell everyone to look into that really helped me, which one of them was a book called Confidence in Conflict by Sports Officials. Um, and it was written by Pete Jaskolski. And confidence in conflict for, for sports officials is so important because what we're doing out there is um, trying to diffuse and de-escalate certain situations and, and modify behavior. And there's another book that I read called Verbal Judo, and I'm, sh I'm sure you're familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the, the gentle art of persuasion. And it, it, these things are so important to put into your, your skill set, your bag of tools to help you to be successful in your career. Uh, thanks, Mark. And I see a couple people raising their hand for, for questions. Um, we'll get into your questions in a minute. If you want to type it in the chat, I'm happy to ask it. I just wanted to get through a couple of, of my questions. Um, Mark, could you re, um, who was the author of that first book? Uh, he, he He's typing it. There we go. There you go. Um, well, Julio's question is actually one of the questions that uh, I had for you, Mark. So good question, Julio. I'm going to ask it now. Soccer is, you know, it's the world's game and, and there's a lot of cross-cultural communication. Our students see that on campus because we're a, a very diverse university, a Hispanic university, close to being a minority majority university. And so um, you come across all different kinds of people. And so you have to learn to communicate in a way that can be understood. And so I know soccer officials when you watch them on tv you know a lot of hand movements a lot of universal yeah. signals for you know that's enough but can you talk about the language barrier and how, how you've navigated that as a soccer official with conflict sure well i'll tell you in Concacaf, in my primary job we have four different languages we have english is our primary spanish uh dutch and french so those are our four official languages in Concacaf. um this past three, four years, we've required the officials to learn English. And if you want to be a tier one, two, or three official in CONCACAF, one of the highest level, you need to be able to speak English and pass an English proficiency exam. So uh, now the push is for all the English speaking officials over the next two years, even myself, yo necesito practica, uh, practica espanol mucho. Uh, you know, we need to learn Spanish, a transferable language. And, and this is important because, you know, if you speak only one language, um, as it translates to your normal business life in the future here, you know, maybe learning a second language could help open up business opportunities to Central America or South America. You know, so learning a second language is so important. So, um, but how, does, uh, how do we communicate effectively on the soccer field? Well, everybody knows what this means. <laughs> and everybody uh, knows what this means. Uh, so, actually, these are important tools to communicate. But you have a whistle. Your tone of your whistle is important. Uh, for simple fouls, you might give a simple tweet. For harder, reckless, or excessive force endangering safety of the opponent type fouls, serious foul play, you might have a really hard whistle. You know, um, you have this, the stop sign. Everybody knows what the stop sign means. It means no more talking, no more walking and approaching you. So if you give the stop sign and people keep walking towards you, then it's really simple just to show the yellow card right after if they don't respect, hey, stay back. So there's some simple communication tools. Um, but what I always recommend, and, and it's funny, I taught a referee from Jamaica, uh, one word. Atras, atras, atras. And uh, that all game long, it worked for him. He got the Mexican team to back up, to stay back. Everything was atras, atras. So, you know, if you do your homework going into a game and you, you know, have one or two or three or four or five different key words that you know in your vocabulary, that's, that's important for, for helping to officiate. I remember officiating the National Intramural Flag Football Tournament back in uh, 1999. And uh, on your application, you had to say, do you speak Spanish? 
And I'm like, well, I took like three years of Spanish in high school, sure. And that meant I got assigned to a women's team from Mexico and they came up talking to me and I, I know some Spanish, but I don't know flag football terms in Spanish. I didn't then, I don't now. Um, so I wish I would have had that education and experience to know how important that is. You were telling me, um, and maybe you could talk about your experience going to India for the Indian uh, Super League. And, and you were part of a group of MLS officials and you told me kind of a fun story. Do you mind sharing what that experience was like going, because you were there for a couple months, right? Yeah, it was in 2014. I was um, very fortunate. I was high performing in the league at the time. And um, the Indian Super League was a brand new inaugural league launching sort of like a major league soccer equivalent there in India. And they, you know, wanted to bring in a lot of international superstars and uh, not the officials, but uh, they brought in some officials. Uh, they had Matarazzi from Italy, they had Zico from Brazil, they had uh, tons of players that were paid millions of dollars to go and, and play in the league over there. And, you know, I was flown over business class. Uh, I think my flight was like $8,000. Um, I went over, I was able and fortunate to work in the inaugural Indian Super League game in Kolkata, India, in Eden Garden Stadium. At the time was uh, the largest stadium in the world with a capacity of 120,000 people. The stadium was packed full. It was uh, one of the most incredible experiences of my life to see um, 20,000 military uh, Indian army around the field with their sticks pushing the spectators back, the spectators with you know, bandanas, faces painted, flares, and you know, it, it was an incredible experience. But being over there, um, you know, it was very humbling to, to, to live in a country like that. I was there for, for one month and then I returned to the United States for two weeks and then was fortunate to go back again for a second trip with another official and uh, work the semifinal and, well, four, uh, five more matches in the semifinal. Um, yeah, uh, tr yes, Chuzai, uh, you did play in India in 2014 as well uh, from Tom. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the, the language barrier was very much uh, there. Uh, luckily, I was paired with some Indian officials that spoke English as well. And one of the commissioners or match evaluators that traveled with us spoke English and was our tour guide around to, you know, all of India. And it was a very incredible experience. And, and you had an interesting flight after one of the games you were telling me about? Oh man, I mean, there there's so many different things. Uh, yeah, we, we had a game in Goa, and after, uh, which is a Portuguese colony, and after the, during the game, we had a situation in front of the other assistant referee where the player headbutt one of the other players. And then going into halftime, uh, the referees didn't see that headbutt. Going into halftime into the locker rooms, there was a mass confrontation, craziness. It was Matarazzi and Zico throwing each other against the wall as the coaches. And um, we ended up going into the locker rooms. And, you know, I'm saying, I, I think he headbutt the guy. And the other guys are saying, no, we didn't see it. So anyways, we go back out onto the field, finish the second half. And we, um, the next morning, got onto the airplane and noticed that the team who uh, got into the mass confrontation was on the same flight with us. And the two officials were sitting in the same row as one of the, the one player who got headbutted. And so it was just, you know, uh, it, was, it was a crazy experience, you know, just, I, I mean, I could tell you I almost died in the airplane too, because we almost ran out of space on the runway in India. And we had to take a last minute uh, ascent back up into the air to do it again. It, you know, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was a great experience. Mark, you mentioned fitness um, being something that, um, young officials have to kind of bring to the game and that's part of the uh, development process. Um, I remember you talking about some of the runs you had to do. I remember before a, a college football season we had to do uh, a mile and a half run in like 15 minutes um, which wasn't hard for anyone who's officiating at that level and that was it. That was our only fitness test and you kind of looked at me and laughed and said you know I have to fly to, to Texas this weekend to do a fitness test. Could you talk about why fitness is so important in soccer and then some of the um, 
kind of tests that are required of officials at the high levels? Yeah, so, you know, soccer's like any other sport in the world in, in terms of fitness. I mean, it's like basketball in a sense, but for longevity, you know, when you think about it to excel, you really, you know, in soccer have to stand out and, and fitness does that for you. You know, fitness helps to make you stand out. And, you know, why is uh, fitness so important is because as you all know, when you're out on the soccer field, if you're not in the right position and you're far away from the incident, people are going to dispute your call. You didn't see it. You're not close. You're so far away. So, you know, presence lends conviction to your call and you need to be there. So fitness is really key to selling a decision. Even if you're wrong, when people look up and they see you're right there, they probably believe you that, you know, it wasn't a foul. So fitness is so important in so many ways, but when you think about fitness testing, oh, I'm so happy I'm retired as an active official because the, the demands of, you know, the fitness test, you know, Gary, uh, as my older brother, you know, I wasn't the most fit person growing up. I was not always into running every single day and eating right and, and having the healthiest of lifestyle. But, you know, I'll tell you, uh, the fitness test to to referee in major league soccer currently you have to pass uh, a high intensity interval test um, you have to pass a change of direction awareness fitness exam and you have to do sprints so first you go out to the ta uh, to the track and you're going to run five sprints and it's like uh, 40 meters and it's, uh, it's different for referee and assistant referee uh, it's like six seconds or uh, four and a half seconds Anyways, uh, the, di the distance is different, but you go out and you, you run these five sprints and you have, um, you have to do them one right after the next. You pass the time. If you fail one time, uh, one of the sprints and the timing, then you have a chance to make it up. If you fail that makeup sprint, then your fitness test is over. But then after the five sprints are done, you have a minute to change your shoes and you go onto the field and you do a change of direction. It's called the CODA exam. And you sprint forward, you sidestep, you sidestep, and you sprint backwards. And you have to do that in 10 seconds or less. Then you have two minutes to change your shoes and get your running shoes on. And then you go out to the track and you have, um, you're going to run now the high intensity interval test, which is 75 meters in 15 seconds. And then you're going to walk 25 meters in 15 seconds. So run, walk, run, walk, run, walk, run, walk around the track, high intensity, heart rate up, heart rate down, and you do uh, 12 laps around the track. And you know, after lap six, you're dying. You want air, you need to breathe, it's, it's really tough. But you know, if, you're, if your fitness level is up there, um, we have a sports science program in CONCACAF, and our sports scientists and the number of programs that he provides to our match, offic match officials, the fitness test is actually the 27th most difficult workout that he prescribes to the officials. So there are so many workouts that are a lot tougher than the fitness check is what we like to refer to it as. Um, so it, it's, very, it, it's very difficult. And at the highest of levels, you're expected to really be fit. And, and I'll tell you, you stand out being fit. You know, um, everyone here probably knows uh, the NFL referee, Ed Hockley, with the big biceps, you know, and I couldn't name another NFL official. I know that guy's name because he stands out with his fitness. Nestor Pitana from Argentina refereed the World Cup final in 2018 in Russia. Everyone knows Nestor Pitana or Howard Webb in the soccer official world because they're the big giant guys or they're really super fit. I know we have some of our uh, fitness students uh, listening in on this. Uh, I'm sure they appreciate it. I, 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 it gave me the shivers thinking about some of those runs, but I think, you know, that of course is at the highest level. Um, do you know, like, I, I imagine I know you always use GPS tracking. How many miles a, a soccer official runs in a professional game? Yeah, it differs based upon your position. If you're the match official in the middle, you average between eight and 11 miles, depending on the style of play, the tactics and strategies being used. If you're an assistant referee, your running is a little bit different. It's about, you know, depending on 
situations, but could be anywhere from uh, two miles to three and a half miles. But that's a lot of sprint, stop, transition, sidestep, sidestep, sprint, walk, change of, you know, transition, change of direction. So it's, it's a little bit more different because as an assistant referee, your role is different. Right. That's probably more similar to basketball because basketball is a lot of sprinting, starting and stopping, but you get a little bit of time if you're, you know, in the lead position and you're walking from baseline to baseline or from a uh, lane line to lane line, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, baseball, um, you know, maybe you're not running as much, but if you're a home plate umpire, you're in a crouch position, um, football, you know, depending on where you are on the field, there's, there's a whole lot of physical demands. I don't think fans definitely don't appreciate the, the physical demands. So I, I'm certain that um, it's important to, to get that out there. I have one or two other questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to some other questions from the group. Um, talking about technology, you know, you, you mentioned you're a video coordinator, um, working with NISOA and the NCAA and then what you do with CONCACAF. Can you talk about what that video coordinator role is and then how important technology is for you to develop and train the officials you're responsible for? Yeah, uh, that's, that's great because, you know, this video, um, you know, editing video, being a video coordinator, what does that entail? It's transferable amongst all of the different things that I do with, you know, NCAA, with NISOA, with, with CONCACAF, and the things I do for FIFA as well. Um, basically, when I watch a soccer game, I watch it different than anybody else. My focus is on certain aspects of the game. I, I track careless fouls, reckless fouls that warrant a yellow card or a red card for a excessive force and serious foul play challenges. Um, so I'm, I tag different incidents that occur, uh, different things such as positioning and movement on, on the referee. I'm looking at tactics of play in terms of uh, counter-attacking style of play, defending style of play, attacking style of play, uh, how throw-ins are taken, the goalkeeper's distribution of the ball. And I'm categorizing these clips and I'm saving them in a repository or I can use them later on when I build presentations for the match officials. So for example, um, this past year, all of the NCAA educational material that was published, all the NISOA uh, stuff as well that was published, I, I did all of that work in terms of all the videos and all of the content that was provided and released that was under all the work that I've done from just watching matches, cutting clips, saving them in a repository and using them to drive education. Yeah, that's so important. You know, that we use technology on our level and I think our intramural program has been at the forefront of that for many years. And we know as officials, um, perfection is a goal, but it's, it's an unreasonable goal, right? Like even the best officials in the world are maybe at the 92, 94% uh, correct call rate. Um, so intramural officials who have one year of experience where, you know, you mentioned it takes 10 years sometimes to really develop confidence. If you think about like Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, it, it took me 10 years as a football official to really feel confident that I could pick out any hold out there. So intramural officials, sometimes, you know, players that are playing the game expect you to be Ed Hockley or Mark Cahan or Shane Land or Heather Marshall but it's just not realistic. And so we need those tools and we also need to communicate, you know, how we develop and train officials so we can educate participants and players as best we can. They're still going to be angry. Um, whatever it is about sports that makes people angry, but the better we can, you know, put out our training tapes and our highlights and our processes and, and use the best technology available. I think we're doing a, a great service to, to officiating. Um, I do want to open it up to some questions in this last part we have here. Julio is coming through again. We have about 20 minutes um, with a question. Julio, do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it? Yeah, so I was just saying I saw that you were also a soccer coach at Bard College. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I was just going to ask like how um, you basically growing up as like an official kind of influenced your perspective as a coach, like with the referees, like did it give you a better rapport with the referees or maybe were you like more hard on them because you knew all the rules or like how did that basically like influence you as a coach? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I think that there's so many things behind that question. 
So the first thing is, is that I, I coached my 12 year old daughter at the time uh, in a recreational league. And I said, you know, this is fun. I really enjoyed the, the coaching side of it. I'd never realized the game from this side of the fence, you know, being an official, you know, I did a lot of things to understand the tactics and strategies and style of play of teams. And I did a lot of research on who was committing, committing the fouls or who the fouls were committed on or who was always offside and all these different things. But I never really thought about uh, tiki taka style of play, different things from, you know, different, uh, different nations and international styles and such. But um, then I, uh, I was injured in officiating in 2016, um, which was sort of what transitioned me to take my family from South Florida. And we moved up to Western Massachusetts where my in-laws live. And we were helping uh, with uh, her family. Uh, her, her father had surgery and we were helping uh, with them. Um, so I, I saw there was an ad in the paper at the local college to be the soccer coach. So I applied and after my interview, landed the job as not only the men's coach, but the women's coach and uh, the gender neutral soccer team coach. Um, it was, it's very interesting how progressive Massachusetts is and, and some of the things that uh, went on. So I, at Bard College, um, basically the, this is the early college and essentially I had kids that were, it was like the bad news bears, it was great. You know, I had 14 year old early college students and, and some 21 year old kids and you know, they from all over the world, a lot of international kids and uh, I sat them down for the first two weeks and we talked about the laws of the game, the, the rules of NCAA play. We talked about, you know, being an official, I, working on the field with, you know, the highest of level players and some of these awesome teams like Manchester United and Barcelona. You know, you, you hear the way that they talk on the field, the players. And they're talking, you know, they're saying, you know, put the ball here, slice it a little one, over your left shoulder, right shoulder, one, two, you know, leave it dummy, all these little key words that you can teach your players to communicate effectively on the team. And after a while, you know, the, the kids, they had never won a game in the college history of their program. And um, I am now the most winningest soccer coach in history. <laughs> uh, we won three of our six games in the season. And so I'm really proud of the, the accomplishments in that sense. But I'll tell you, you know, there's a lot of gamesmanship that goes on in, in officiating and coaching. Hey, ref. Oh, thank goodness you're here today. We're so glad you're here. You're the best referee we've ever had. Yeah, they're, they're shaking. They're, hey, ref, how are you? Right? So, you know, this gamesmanship that goes on, it, you know, I know, uh, I know this and I know that it goes on. And, you know, I would always bring, you know, a set of cards or a coin you know, and, and go to the referee before the game and say, hey, how you doing? You know, I was a former MLS uh, referee. Here, I wanted to give you this. Here's a coin, you know. And I would always use that gamesmanship and put them on notice that I knew what the rules were, the laws of the game were. So, you know, um, I once talked a referee out of not calling the ball out of play because I was just saying, they're kids, let them keep playing. So, you know, um, yeah, what a, what a great experience that was. And, uh, you know, I think it's important as officials to become registered as a coach, to understand what, you know, their jobs are on the line, you know, and, you know, there's a lot at stake for these guys. Some of these, I mean, your UCF coach is probably making $100,000 a year with his career. And if he doesn't have a winning season, you know, what's he going to do next? So, yeah, great question. Cool. So um, any other questions from the, the group? I do have a couple more, but if anyone wants to uh, put one in the chat or unmute and ask it, go on ahead. Right, I'm going to ask one of my other questions that was submitted uh, in advance. Mark, aside from on-field officiating, um, you know, the talent that an observer sees, what are some of the qualities that an assigner is looking for in an official? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned earlier is that being available. Um, I had an assigner that would call me and, and ask me for games and I'd never turn them down. And 
I was always the practical referee. I was never the by the book referee where I was always black and white. The rule says this. I always thought about the game and the spirit of the game. And I'd always empathize with players. Uh, later on in my career, I would empathize with players. Um, and I, I think that, you know, not being reported as uh, someone who's a bad official, not someone who's always giving red cards and yellow cards when they shouldn't. And, you know, having that reliability and always being committed and, and showing that you're hungry to, to reach a higher level is so important. Um, humility, just being humble and worrying about yourself and not worrying about others and the assignments they get. Now that's good advice. I think a lot of officials, whether you're going to uh, a camp or a regional tournament, you're always thinking about, hmm, am I as good as that person? Or I, I think I'm better than them. Or wow, these guys are really good. These ladies are really good. And it gets your confidence down. And so it, it, that's great advice. I always um, try to keep that in mind. And we're human. We, we were always going to compare ourselves to other people, but it, it's really important. I see uh, Ryan has a question. Um, Mark, we talk a lot about in basketball, like doing film breakdown as a way to continue to improve when you're not, you know, working the games. What kind of things do you look for in soccer officials to continually improve outside? Um, and what kind of advice do you have? Yeah, so uh, good question. I'll tell you that, you know, in soccer, the future is with video assistant refereeing and using technology in the game. So the more that you can watch the game and analyze different game situations and look at clips and, and become a better judge of decision making, um, I think that's one of the most uh, important key elements in analyzing video and challenging yourself uh, because the future is going to be having more video match officials um, confidentially. I'll tell you that uh, FIFA is looking to create a video match official badge for FIFA officials. Now, this is something that they're looking at in the future, which is, you know, as we know, the future of how a lot of things are going to be operating in these times. And, and I think that's an important thing to think about, particularly with soccer, because, you know, when I officiated a football game, there's seven or eight people on a game for 22 players on a little bit of a smaller field than a soccer field. Whereas you have one, you know, match official and two assistant referees for the same number of players and a lot of open space. And so it's hard to officiate a soccer game. I always, I would be watching a game and I would send you a, a question or a clip, or did you see that it'd be at the Orlando city game? And it's, it's one of the most difficult sports to officiate. Um, but at the same time, you can go long periods of time where the game just plays itself. And so I think for, those students who are interested in pursuing soccer, um, I think it's very helpful to get a perspective of officiating a lot of different sports because you can really sharpen certain skills, whether, whether it's reaction time, whether it's patience, whether it's the conflict management that's pretty similar across all sports. So I, I always find that just kind of be an interesting thing about the sport of soccer. Uh, Julio, did you have another question? I see your hand up. Yeah, I was watching um, like a FIFA World Cup video on YouTube just about things that happened, basically, um, like big moments. And I saw one that you probably know about um, in 2006 when one of the Croatian players was actually given three yellow cards and then given a red card after that. Um, yeah, that just ties into my question a little bit. Like how important is it to be like focused on basically who's doing what throughout the game? Because I know there's some games that are a lot more physical than others, like where there's a lot more fouls and stuff like that. So how important is it to be like focused on basically who's committing what foul, who's being too aggressive and stuff like that throughout the game? Yeah, good question. It's, it's extremely important. And one of the things that we do in CONCACAF is we have our CONCACAF-isms. And our CONCACAF-isms, one of them is after every yellow card, you write. So here you can see on this yellow card that you have to write the, the number of the player, the time and the reason. So therefore, after you show this card to the public, you take your pen and you write, and, there, and that way you won't have three yellow cards given in the match. And it's important at the level of what you're mentioning at the World Cup, you have a fourth official who's, you know, the person who's not running on the field, who's in between the two benches, who's managing the substitutions and the technical areas with the teams. So uh, in your pregame prior to the match, you, one of the things that's so important is, you know, 
talking about these responsibilities with your, with your colleagues and saying to the fourth official, hey, uh, do me a favor because persistent infringement, sometimes um, I'm not thinking, uh, did number seven commit his fourth or fifth foul? Do me a favor, Mr. Fourth Official, keep track of who's committing the most fouls. And if you see it's somebody's third foul, let me know over the radio or give me some sort of hand signal or sign language or something. You know, so yeah, these are, these are extremely important things that we talk about at a high level um, and at a very low level in terms of match preparation and pregame. Mark, I had a, a question along those lines. Um, players in all sports embellish, but I just maybe anecdotally from watching soccer my whole life, I don't think any sport has as many floppers as soccer and writhing on the ground and getting cold sprayed and getting taken off in a stretcher. Um, you just don't see that in other sports. So from a, 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 an official's perspective, how do you teach and train your officials to manage um, flopping? Yeah, so uh, great question, Gary. And I'll tell you, at the highest level right now, what we're doing is anytime a player flops, goes down, and claims for injury to help delay the restart of the game, our officials are immediately instructed to call for the stretcher, immediately. That way, the stretcher comes out, the doctor comes out, and the player either gets on the stretcher and goes off the field, or he immediately gets up. And now you've set the bar and you have set the precedent that, you know, this guy, uh, if he gets up right away, you know, now the world understands what's going on. And if it happens again, you know, you can manage the game with, you know, misconduct as, you know, accordingly. But, you know, during the game, um, I think that there's some considerations to simulation that can be taken into consideration, right? And, you know, did the attacker um, commit the contact with the defender first and then simulated or did the defender make contact with the attacker first and then the embellishment of that contact uh, you know so there's different ways of looking at the variations of these things and and that's a whole nother hour-long discussion that you know we won't get into right now uh another important question is the the stuff the referee sprays on the ground is that shaving cream no, it's soap and water. And um, when I was just at the under 20 women's championship in the Dominican Republic, um, all of our spray was confiscated by customs in the Dominican Republic. Um, it's just soap and water. I have all the documentation to show. Uh, yeah, so. Have you ever had to play in a game where they're like throwing a bunch of stuff on the field from like the stands? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, in Major League Soccer, in the United States, it's a lot better. I mean, I think in Seattle and Portland, the environment for Major League Soccer is that, like Kansas City, they're wild, erupting. You know, it's such a great experience to be an official there, and I love those. And when the team gives away, um, what are the, the little foosball, uh, not foosball, the hacky sacks. When the team gave away hacky sacks one night, uh, in Kansas City, I was pegged by probably five hacky sacks for running on the field. So, um, but recently we had our, our CONCACAF League final in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And uh, when I was there, it was quite an experience because uh, the assistant referee number two had firecrackers thrown at him, glass bottles, rocks. It's really, um, it's just a different environment in Central America when it comes to some of our Champions League games. and. Um, we're, we're at CONCACAF making a lot of changes to different security protocols because imagine New York City or LA Galaxy going into Honduras and, and you know, you, or a Mexican team. You can't have those types of situations uh, occur. So that's, yeah, it's, it's crazy sometimes. I mean, I've been chased out of parking lots. I've been, um, you know, shot at. You know, people pulled knives on colleagues. I mean, you know, in South Florida, we have some some wild and crazy amateur leagues, uh, affiliated, non-affiliated, and you know, part of uh, part of being the best match official is getting a lot of experience. And you know, the Caribbean leagues. I mean, there's there's a, a variety of great leagues out there. So yeah, no, that's scary. And I know a lot of us always worry about when we're officiating um, our safety. So it's 
I think that's where the comfort is in officiating high school sports, um, getting experience in a, in a place where, um, you know, there's a security officer, there's an athletic director, the fans are separated, helps you build up your confidence to there. If you're fortunate enough to officiate at the highest levels or the international level, um, those things don't phase you as much, although I imagine they'd scare everyone. Natalie has a question. It says, what is the most, who is the most notable player that has gotten mad at you? And did that make you sad? Oh, um, I remember getting yelled at, at David Beck, uh, by David Beckham my first year in MLS, which is his last year in the league, um, just over a stupid throw-in decision. Uh, he thought it was one way, and I thought it was the other way. And, you know, w did it make me sad? You know, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a great question, I'll tell you. Um, it made me sad knowing that some guy making millions of dollars could yell at some guy making a thousand bucks to be on the field that day and way to make me feel really good about being a referee. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty sad. Natalie's uh, fangirling right now, I believe the term is. Um, <laughs> let's see. Tom, you have a question? Um, yes. So kind of to go hand in hand with the one Natalie asked, like, um, have you ever worked with any referees or ref any players that really just made you kind of like starstruck or kind of once you go out there, you kind of forget about everything and you're just repping any other game? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think I was starstruck every single time. And the coolest thing about being a referee at these, at these games, you know, um, the messy all-star game, having all these, you know, all these players got paid like a hundred thousand dollars to come to play one game and it was a tour of Messi and his friends and to sit there and and I have a photo with me and Messi shaking hands you know and and to have these really cool experiences where you know I've been able to shake hands with all these really cool players from you know teams all around the world that got to referee Boca Juniors and uh, Fiorentina from Italy or Paris Saint Germain and you know, to, to be in, in some of these stadiums, I mean, it's, it's just an incredible, humbling experience. So, um, you know, I, I guess it's just, Thank you. I, I wish I could go back out there and do it again. And it is sad as a retired official not being out there anymore. You know, you really go through a state of depression in a sense, but I'm fortunate because after being off the field at that level, uh, I was hired at, in CONCACAF and able to continue with the craft that I've loved, you know, for 30 years I've been doing this, essentially. And I think, um, I thank you, Mark, for that answer. And I know we're at the end of our time. I, I think it's super important to um, let that be kind of the lasting message of, I know many of us that have officiated, I'm, I'm retired as well. Um, it's so important to have officiating as this avocation that, that complements and supplements uh, what we do for work. And many of us are fortunate to tie those two things together. Um, but you got to have a plan for after you officiate, or you got to have a plan for if um, you get injured or, um, you know, the situation we're in right now. And so I think it's, it's super important to make sure you continue your academic pursuits and um, work on your career. And if you're fortunate enough to get opportunities at the higher level, that's great. But also, you know, we need officials at every level. So, so to continue uh, this pursuit beyond what you're doing. So I know there's probably some other questions, maybe down the line, uh, we can schedule uh, another session for those who have questions. Shane did ask me to do some plugs. Um, I will plug for any of our students on here. Uh, make sure you check out our KLS podcasts. Um, we've recorded a couple of those already, and um, they count just like this as credit. You can listen to them and, and do a reflection. Um, Shane or Heather or Nikki, uh, Courtney can send you that information. And then next Friday, uh, we have Danica Mosher. Is that correct, Shane? Danica's a former Intramural official, Intramural supervisor, now in the NBA, uh, WNBA, G League uh, system, having tons of success. So she's going to do a talk. Next week, Shane, did you want to say anything more about that? Nope, that works. Awesome. So, intramural staff, stick around. Mark, 
thank you so much for joining us. Um, hopefully everyone got something out of this and uh, I'll talk to you offline, but thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.